Today I'm going to show you how to use class modules with a dictionary in Excel VBA and then I'm going to show you something you won't have seen before. How to make a VBA collection behave exactly like a dictionary with a few simple code changes. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we need to understand is why we use class modules with a dictionary. Well imagine we're storing sales of fruit. We store an apple and a number of sales like this. So apple is our key and a number of sales is our item in the dictionary. And then we could add a second item like this. Say for example orange and the sales are 100. But imagine now we have data that looks like this. Not only do we want to store sales but we also want to store the amount as well. We can only store one value per entry in the dictionary so how do we store multiple values? So the way we do it is we use class modules because class modules allow us to group a number of variables together and then we can store the class module in our dictionary. To add a class module, we simply right click and insert class module. You'll see that a class module now appears in our project window. We change the class module name to CLS fruit in the properties window like this. Now we add variables to our class module. We say public name as string, public sales as long, and public amount as currency. Now we have our class module set up, let's look at how we can use it. We start by declaring our CLS fruit variable, dim fruit as new CLS fruit. And then we can assign values like name equals apple and sales equals 100. Let's step through the code and see exactly what's happening. We look at the watch window and we can drop the fruit variable in there. Stepping through the code, you'll see what we've got is fruit and we've now got name equals to apple. Now if we step over this line, you can now see that sales equals 100. The key thing to understand with objects is when and how to use the keyword set. The first line here is equivalent to declaring the variable and then setting the fruit to a new CLS fruit. This means the first line is equivalent to using the second and third line. Both do the same thing, but the difference is that set gives us flexibility and what this means is that we can put it in a for loop or an if statement and so on. Whereas the dim line means that every time the code runs, we've just got one of these objects. Let's look at putting set in a loop. We can say this loop equals for i equals one to five, and then we can create the object here. So we set fruit equals new fruit. Now I'm gonna put the fruit name to have i at the end so that we can see it as it runs through the loop. So let's look in our watch window and this is very interesting to see what happens here. Let's remove the first line as we don't need it. We step through the code for i equals one to five. Fruit you can see is nodding at the moment. Now we can see fruit has variables, which means it has been created. So we place apple plus the value of i as the name of the first item, and then we place i as the sales value. Now we go to the next one. We set fruit equals new fruit. It's empty, so fruit name equals apple two and sales equals two. So what happened to the first one and what exactly is going on? Well, to understand what's happening here, we need to have a little look under the hood and see exactly what happens when class modules are created in VBA. When we create a variable like this, VBA creates the equivalent of a cell in memory. And then when we place a value in that variable, VBA stores the value in memory, something like this. And this works for all basic types. We just have a space in memory and VBA stores the values there. Now the way an object works is a little different. When we declare an object like this, VBA declares the variable, so it creates the cell in memory, and the cell is empty at the moment. And then when we say set fruit equal new CLS fruit, what happens is the new CLS fruit part creates the new object in memory, and then it takes the address and places the address in fruit. Now if we do dim fruit as a new CLS fruit, it's basically doing what we did in the previous two lines, it does them in one line. So why does VBA work like this? It might seem a little crazy at first, but it actually makes perfect sense. Imagine you've got a database in a company. Now every time the user wanted to use a database, imagine they had to create a copy of that database and copy it to their computer. So that wouldn't make much sense, it'd be very inefficient. And not only that, we'd have multiple versions of the database, which would end up being a nightmare. So this is exactly why VBA treats objects like this. We have the address of fruit, and then if we decide that we want to add this object to a dictionary, rather than creating a new copy, which would have a bit of overhead, and which would mean we have two versions, VBA simply copies the value into the dictionary. So copies the address 
as the value. It does this seamlessly, so you don't actually know that it's going on. What this means then is that if we say set fruit equals new fruit, we actually create a new object. And VBA puts the memory address in the variable, just like before. And then if we come along and we add it to the dictionary, then VBA does the same thing. It just adds the address to our dictionary. So we're not creating two versions of the same object. We're referencing the same one. Now, if this doesn't make sense, just think of it like this. Every time we use new, so either with set or with dim, we're creating a new object in memory. That's when the new object gets created. In all other circumstances, VBA is simply copying the address of the object. Okay, let's see now how to add an object to the dictionary. What we do is we create our dictionary first of all. When we add an item to the dictionary, we need to see if that item already exists. If apple doesn't exist, what we want to do is we want to create a new fruit object. And we do this by setting fruit to equal new CLS fruit. If apple already exists in the dictionary, we don't need to create a new object. We want to use the existing one from the dictionary. Now when we create the fruit, we add the name which is going to be apple. We then add it to the dictionary so the key is apple and the item is fruit. This is quite simply how we deal with adding an item to the dictionary. Now that we understand how to add to the dictionary, let's do our full example and you can see how we can put everything together. This is the data we have and what we want to do is get the sum of all the sales and all the amounts for each fruit. And we're going to use a dictionary to do this. The reason we use the dictionary is because every time we read the name of a fruit in our data, we can easily check if it already exists in the dictionary and if it does, we can easily access it. Whereas if we use something like an array, we have to go through each item in the array to find the one we want. So let's write the code to do this. The first thing we want to do is get the range so we declare a range variable. And we then set the range equal to B3. This is where the data is and then we use current region to give us back the, all the adjacent data to this cell. Now we're going to read through the data. We use i as our variable and we create a for loop. We say for i equals 2 because we want to skip the header so we don't want to read row 1. And we loop through the number of rows in the range. Now I'm going to create another variable here and this will be the name of the fruit. And just having it as a variable makes our code that bit more readable. We use range cells to read the data from the worksheet. The row is i, which is the current row in our loop, and the column for name is column 1. Let's create our dictionary. We create our dictionary at the start of the sub. We want to check now, does the name of fruit exist in the dictionary? And if it doesn't exist, what we want to do is create a new CLS fruit object. Let's create our fruit variable fruit as CLS fruit. We set fruit equals new CLS fruit. And then we want to write fruit name equals name. So the current name that we're reading. And then what we want to do is to add this new object to the dictionary. So we do dictionary add, the key is the name and the item is the fruit object. Now if it's already in the dictionary, we want to set fruit to equal that item in the dictionary. In other words, we are copying the address of the item from the dictionary to the fruit variable. Let's just look at this code again. If the item does not exist in the dictionary, we create a fruit object and then we set the name and then add it to the dictionary. So we use with fruit to reduce the number of times we have to type the word fruit. And we say amount equals amount plus the value at column four. We can then say sales equals sales plus the value at column three. We then say end with to end this with fruit section. Now we want to check to see if we have read the data correctly. I'm going to create a simple print dictionary sub to write out the contents of the dictionary. We create that here like this, print dictionary, and this takes the dictionary as a parameter. Then we get the key as the variant, and we say for each key in the dictionary, and now we say fruit as CLS fruit. So for each key in the dictionary, we get the item, and then we say set fruit equals the item at the dictionary key. And now we want to print out the names. So we use fruit and we print out the names, sales and so on. And then we finish by adding the next key. 
and then we do a call to the print dictionary and pass the dictionary as the parameter. If it all has worked as we expect, then it should write out the results to the immediate window. Let's run the code. And you can see that it wrote out the results as we expected. So we should check the original data to make sure Apple has 71 in sales as the total. So it's always good to check this to make sure there isn't an error in our code. For Apple, you can see that we have sales of 30 and again, we have sales of 41. So the total that we have is correct. Now, the final thing we're going to do is that we're going to see how we can exploit a little known feature of the collection and get it to behave exactly like the dictionary. But first of all, let's write out the results to the worksheet instead of the immediate window, because this is what we do in a real world application. To do this, we don't have to change the print dictionary sub very much at all. We need to get the range first. So we create a range variable and then we set the range equal to the sheet and to the range, which is G3. So this has given us the cell we're going to start writing the data. The first thing we're going to do though is clear any existing data, which is always an important thing to do. We do range current region to give us all the adjacent data in case there is any. All the adjacent data includes the header which we don't want to delete. So we use offset to simply move it down one row. So we set the parameter of the offset to one and then we simply clear the contents. Now it's important to always do this because we don't want to mix the existing data with data we may have written before from a previous run. So now when we're writing it out, we say range cells and the row and we'll set this in a moment and we write out the value. Now we declare our variable as row so row equals one, because it's the first row that we're going to write it out to, the first row in our range. And then every time we write it out, we want to move to the next row. So we simply add one to row after we write out the current row. And let's run the code and see if it gets the result we're expecting. And you can see that the results came out exactly as we were expecting. They match what's in the immediate window. And number two, the important thing as well is that they're actually written to the correct place in the worksheet. Now I'm going to show you how to replace the dictionary with the collection and by just using a few small code tweaks, I will get it to behave exactly like the dictionary. Now many people don't know this, but the VBA collection also has the option to use a key as well. For example, here we're adding Apple as the key and 99 as the item. And when we run the code, you can see that by using the key, we can get back 99. Now the one drawback with the collection is that if we try and update a value, it doesn't allow it because the collection is read only. But as we saw already, when we add an object variable to a collection, it's not actually storing the object in the collection, it's just storing the variable. So what this means in very simple terms is that we can change the object when we add it to a collection. And now we're going to replace this dictionary with a collection. So why would you want to do this? Well, there's two main reasons. The first one, as I mentioned already, is that if you're using a Mac, then you don't have access to the dictionary. And the second reason is that when you use a dictionary, you need to use either early binding or late binding. And both of these have their advantages and disadvantages. But if you use a collection, you don't have to worry about any of that. So now let's change the dictionary to a collection. So the first major issue is that there's no exists function for the collection, but we can get around this very easily. We just create our own exists function like this. And then we just pass the collection as the first item. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to change how we write it out. And in fact, it's easier to write out because we can use fruit in the for each loop. We don't have to set it. And before we run the code, we're going to get rid of the existing data just to make sure that it worked correctly this time. Now, when we run it, you can see it gave us the exact same results as when we used the dictionary. So now you can see how we can use the collection instead of the dictionary when we're dealing with objects. If you'd like to know more about the class modules or the dictionary, then check out one of the playlists on the screen. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the like button. And if you'd like to get notified of my upcoming videos, then hit the subscribe button and the bell icon beside it.